for tuning in. Good morning. This is Customs 101 webinar, and my name is Nicholas Aruho, who will be your host today. Today we are looking at the cargo clearance process from the port up to the bonded warehouse, but with special emphasis on WT8 processing, uh, which is the entry that delivers the cargo from the port. Uh, in the studio today, I have the experts from the different areas that process these entries. I have an expert from the port, I have an expert from the document processing center, and an expert from warehousing. Uh, like I say, this is Customs 101. Thank you so much for tuning in, and you can follow us on all our social media platforms, and these are always uploaded on our uh, YouTube page. So whenever you miss anything, you can always go back and watch it. Uh, so uh, without uh, going any further, uh, let me introduce our panelists today. I will allow them to introduce themselves, beginning with the gentleman on my immediate left. Uh, good morning, our viewers and listeners. My name is Thomas Ategeka. I'm a customs officer uh, deployed at the port of Mombasa. Thank you for tuning in. Good morning, listeners and viewers. And welcome back from Labor Day celebrations. My name is Edmund Otewemberwa, acting manager in warehousing, Kampala. Good morning, uh, viewers and listeners. Um, my name is Ephraim Mugenyi Mulindwa. I'm currently uh, serving as a supervisor in the document processing center. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, <coughs> panelists. And uh, the topic, once more, is the clearance process uh, from the port. And we are looking at the enhanced clearance process where we want our viewers and our clients to ensure seamless clearance and faster clearance of cargo. And as customs, our work is to ensure that we clear this cargo and we facilitate faster clearance of cargo. So that's why we are here today to discuss how we can facilitate you better to ensure faster clearance of your cargo from the port with special emphasis on the WT8 uh, declaration. Uh, now, I will begin with you, Edmund. Uh, I, I, would like you to, I would like you to enlighten the, the, the viewers. Uh, what is the WT8? You, so you will t take us through what a WT8 means, why is it important in the clearance process, and the type of goods that are supposed to declare a WT8. Over to you, Edmund. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, listeners and viewers, for having tuned in for this presentation. Once again, my name is Edmund Rutewe Mberwa, and I'm here to give the introductory part in regard to our presentation today. And the presentation, as they have just emphasized, it's the WT8 processing. Why is it called the WT8? Not any other name. What is it supposed to do? How is it supposed to process? And how does it feed into other processes? Is what I'm going to present on right now. We all know that we have a single customs territory process which was introduced around 2017 there. And we know that upon importation under single customs territory at the port, there are two options at the first port of entry into the territory. In our case, we can simply say Mombasa and Rasaram. You can either clear for direct home use, which we call IM4, or you can bond cargo into bonded warehouses where you are going to subsequently have them ex warehoused. Like cargo which is proceeding to the bonded warehouses within here, Maritpo, Borore, Maina, Ribate. Now, those are the two options you have. And our option is option number two right now, which we are going to concentrate on, which is a WT8. In simple terms, a WT8 is a declaration under single customs territory that transfers cargo under customs control from either first port of entry or partner state to the bonded warehouse in the count of importation or destination. So that WT8 is the one that transfers cargo if you are not intending to pay taxes or to clear for home consumption right away from the port of Mombasa, you use a regime that we call a WT8 have your cargo transferred into a bonded warehouse and pay taxes at a later time, which is always within six months, <coughs> or extendable up to nine months by the Commissioner Customs. 
AWT8 converts to an IM7 and concurrently in two games, implying that appropriate data must be stocked. And this is achieved through perfection of a WT8 as a primary declaration by giving it due attention and conforming to all the requirements of basic transaction documents. We are now seeing how important it is. It means once you put in garbage, it will be garbage out. And all the work begins on the declaration of a WT8. Because this WT8 will come, reach the bonded warehouses, get auto-converted. You no longer have a chance of those days where you would say, I'm going to get a manifest, then I will declare right away. If I had declared one item, I still have an option of getting a manifest and I declare 10 items. No, that lucky state or that mode is no longer existing. It's auto-converted. Meaning that for us to have right stock into our bonds, into the BMS system, you must have made an authentic WT8 right away from the beginning. And it's the reason we're having this presentation, to give some insights on how you can make a proper WT8 so that you do not get subsequent penalties and offenses when you come inland. Because if you declare eight items instead of ten, it means we shall auto-convert eight items and stock in only eight items, yet you had ten items. Where will the two go? It means the two will be and declare the cargo and you end up on offenses, penalties, which all cause delay and unnecessary costs. It uses a single declaration, of course being under single customs territory and a regional cargo transit bond, the one we call RCTG. So you use only one single declaration as opposed to the traditional methods where one would reach in Kenya, make a, a TA 12 by KRA, reach in Uganda, make a T1 to come to the bond. Those would be two clearing agents and two declarations and two bonds in force. That is the bond in Kenya and the bond in Uganda. But the WT8 is just a single declaration and you use one regional bond and you use one clearing agent. Of course, in this time, it will be in the reporting country, which is Uganda, and it will fetch cargo right away from there port of entry either Dar es Salaam or Mombasa into the bonded warehouse. WT, WT letters, they stand for warehouse transfer. And this is domesticated. It's not international. You can call it anything. DIGIT 8 stands for transit regime as per the international standards. We all know that as per UNCTAD, letter number 8 means transit. Number 4 means home consumption. Number one, permanent export. Five, temporary importation. Six, re-importation. So in this case, eight is standard internationally, but WT8 is domesticated. You can use any other data, but so long as you maintain eight. So DIGIT8 stands for transit regime as per the international standards. For all imports destined for warehousing in destination land countries, in this case, let me give an example of Burundi, Rwanda, and Uganda. URA, which is Uganda, uses a WT8 model. RRA, which is Rwanda, uses WH7. OBRA, which is Burundi, uses SW7. That is now how do they ferry cargo right off from the port into their bonded warehouses. Those are the different regimes and processes they use. First of all, Rwanda and Burundi operate a central bonded warehouse and is being controlled by government. Now you are seeing how different we are. We are all around rocked, but for them they have one central bonded warehouse operated by government. That's why they use a CB6 or IM7 to at the same time cover goods which are in transit. So it's the same government, so the same, the moment cargo disappears along the way, they can recover because it's the same government which is covering and can as well extend the cover. Now Uganda is different. You all know we are in a liberalized economy, we are having private prayers, bonded warehouses are private. At the moment, we have 185 bonded warehouses which are privately owned and with respective insurance companies. Equally, if we are to use an IM7, the same way as Rwanda, now assuming cargo disappeared along the way, would the IM7 or would the bonding force of storage be able to cover goods in transit? No. 
there is no insurance company you will just execute a bond to store goods then you tell them goods along the way disappeared please help us and recover no so it's the reason that's where the logic came in and we had to combine warehousing transfer regime so that we can bond the goods which are in transit and at the same time we also use a separate bond for goods which are under storage so the wt8 combines both a transit regime and a warehousing regime so basically that's all about the wt8 why we call it the wt8 it combines both and upon you reaching the bonded warehouses it will automatically auto convert into an im7 because remember there are two words they are like twin words warehousing and transfer so at the same time you are transferring and immediately you reach in since we have already committed that it's a warehousing transfer then it will automatically translate into a warehousing regime and that transit regime like i said is basically to cover all protect goods as they move right off from the first port of entry while on en route to the bonded warehouses maybe a reminder as per the section 64 of the EC, East African Community Customs Management Regulations, the Commission has powers to keep on listing goods which are eligible and ineligible for warehousing. And in this case, you must have seen an advert, you must have seen a public notice reminding people that effective 1st June, some items have been added on the eligibility list for warehousing. So, maybe a recap, we have wheat flour and wheat grain, we have mobile devices, and mobile phones we have tires marble granite of all kinds we have lubricants we have automotive batteries we have toiletries and cosmetic products we have pasta and spaghetti and we have flavors for soft drinks so be reminded that effective first june these items will be clearing direct for home consumption right away from the first port of entry rather than going for warehousing as the two options which i mentioned earlier with this brief introduction allow me to hand over back to the moderator for the next presentation i thank you thank you so much edman thank you so much edman for that elaborate description of what a wt8 is and why it is important in the clearance process Our viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. In case you've just tuned in, this is Customs 101 webinar. And we are talking about the enhanced clearance process from the port with special emphasis on the WT8. And I have three gentlemen in the studio whom you will be listening to. And we've already heard from uh, Edmund who described what the WT8 is and why it is important in the clearance process. Now I will return to Ephraim. You are a supervisor in DPC, and DPC is the Document Processing Center. So you are the ones that process these documents. You are the ones that release these WT8s. So I would like you to take us through uh, the role of DPC in this whole process, uh, and also the documentation. Uh, what should people do what should people know uh, what is the importance of having these documents attached which kind of documents should they attach and what should clients do in order to avoid unnecessary delays in dpc to ensure faster clearance of cargo over to you ifrain thank you very much uh, moderator <coughs> uh, just uh, as a reminder my name is ifrain uh, from the document processing center My colleague uh, Edmond has just taken us through uh, the background of the WT8 and why the WT8. This is a, a very important uh, uh, document or declaration process in the clearance of cargo because it is the initial document or declaration that transfers uh, cargo to our country for further processing. And therefore, like he has said, This document feeds into the warehousing uh, system. It feeds into the BIM system. So for us to ably uh, process and facilitate trade efficiently, the WT8 has to be uh, near perfect. Because he has told us about the auto conversion. 
Auto conversion is an, an innovation by customs to reduce um, uh, multiple declaration uh, capture by the agent. So it helps to automatically convert the WTA to an IM7. So it is important that the WTA is uh, well managed and the, the data that is captured on the WTA is, uh, is correct. Many a times what we are seeing today is that uh, we are seeing a lot of um, errors, a lot of missed declarations, a lot of under declarations. And when auto conversion happens to an IM7, you find that an, an, a WTA only has, uh, let's say, eight items, and yet in, in, in the consignment you have over 50 uh, items. And all those about 30 or 40 items that are not declared uh, end up uh, requiring further amendment at the DPC, which is causing a lot of delays, putting a lot of demands on the document processing uh, officers, and yet they should be focusing on uh, vetting the documents and uh, clearing uh, the documents so that uh, people can have their goods. But you, what you find now is that most of the time, the officers, because of the declarations which with missing information, with under declarations and, and excess, the officers are spending a lot of time trying to amend these declarations. So it is important that we now emphasize that our dear uh, taxpayers, our declarants, please ensure that before you make a declaration, you have all the necessary documents to enable you make an accurate declaration. Once you have all the documents, then you'll be able to capture the information that is required on the side. Otherwise, it is, it is very difficult if you do not have information to make an accurate declaration. It is these documents that then customs are required to vet the WTA to see the consistency and all the information that is required so that the declaration is released. Wrong declarations, like I've said, are the huge uh, are the biggest cause of delays in, in, in the document processing center because the officers are now having to take away time in, uh, that is meant for document processing and devoting it to actually data entry. Now, the system, uh, you should have noticed a change. Because of, in initially, before we introduced the BIMS system, uh, agents could capture the excess goods would be captured under the CW7. But with the introduction of BIMS, the CW7 is no longer applicable. Now what is happening? All those items have to be captured on the declaration. So if the agent or declarant does not capture those items, it puts a huge demand on the officers, whether in warehousing or DPC, to then do the amendments and so that those, those items are captured. Otherwise, they will not be reflected in the stock, as uh, my colleague uh, Edmond has elaborated. Now, there are several documents uh, that are required in uh, international trade uh, when we are clearing uh, cargo through customs. Uh, now, documentation plays an important role in the smooth movement of goods in international trade. Facilitation of legitimate trade depends on proper documentation. Several documents are involved in carrying out international business transactions. And uh, these documents have uh, characteristics. They, they, there is a form and a certain sequence in which these documents are issued and they flow. So we expect that, the, uh, for example, from the time of purchase to the time of uh, clearing, there are several documents that are involved. Some documents are mandatory, while others are optional, depending on the nature of the goods that uh, one is uh, clearing. If you look at uh, uh, the information that is required on the SAD, that information, you can only get it if you have a document, if you have these docu transaction documents. Information such as the, the date, the serial number, the name of the supplier, the importer, the quantities, the units, if you do not have the accurate documents, you will not be able to capture the declaration properly. So it is imperative that the agent or the declarant has this information. So our appeal to the taxpayers is that 
please provide detailed information to the declarant so that they are able to capture accurate information. Otherwise, we will be having a lot of delays in our systems, which is really unnecessary and can be avoided. Now, these documents, uh, in summary, can be categorized under four categories. Uh, uh, the first category uh, is the commercial documents. Then we have documents which can be categorized as uh, tr uh, transport documents. And then we have the financial documents. And then lastly, the regulatory documents. If I'm to go through the, the commercial documents, uh, for example, these are documents that we all know. For example, the sales contract. The sales contract is basically a document that uh, sets out the terms of the transaction between the buyer and seller. It sets out the circumstances under which the transaction is going to be uh, con uh, completed between the two parties. Then we have the purchase order. The purchase order principally is uh, an initial uh, document by the buyer to the seller indicating that they want to buy a certain uh, type of good and in what quantity. Whereas uh, when the, the seller receives the purchase order, he's then able to issue a performer invoice to the buyer for them to be able to ascertain whether the prices are right, the quantities are correct, and also it also contains information such as the banking information in case the buyer has to pay cash. If the buyer then approves what is in the conformer, in the, in the performer invoice, then the supplier issues what we call as the commercial invoice as the final document that shows what the buyer owes to the seller. Then we have the transport documents. These are very important documents for the movement of cargo from the origin to the port of de destination and eventually into our country. Uh, documents such as the shipping bill or export documents, these are documents that are captured in the exporting country, the declarations at the exporting countries. And we see a lot of these from countries such as uh, India and South Africa. Then we have the bill of lading or AOA bill. Uh, this document is very important because it facilitates the movement of the cargo from the origin to destination port. And it contains very vital information. And it is one of the key documents that confers title to actually the owner or consignee of the goods. And then we have the freight invoice. The freight invoice, depending on the terms that the parties have been agreed, sometimes the seller is the one who meets the freight cost. But in situations where the buyer is the one to meet the cost of, of freight, then we expect that an, a freight invoice is uh, presented uh, as well as the insurance certificate. Because as you know, in, in our East African Customer Man Management Act, under the fourth schedule, freight and insurance are part of the customs value, uh, particularly so if the goods come in through the ports of Mombasa. So we need these documents in order to ascertain how much freight was paid and the insurance uh, for the goods. The next category is uh, regulatory documents. As you know, our role is not just to uh, facilitate trade and collect taxes, but we also have a duty to protect the, uh, the general public. So some of these documents are regulatory in nature. For example, we have a certificate of origin in case one needs to benefit from preferential treatment. And then we have uh, other permits, for example, from National Drug Authority, um, from the Minister of Agriculture. Some products, the they are restricted. So in order to import those goods, you need uh, permits from the regulatory uh, agencies. So in case you're importing such goods, you have to ensure those documents are attached. Then we have uh, documents such as fumigation certificate, phytosanitary certificate, especially uh, we have a lot of uh, used uh, clothes and uh, shoes coming into our country. As a poor country, we're still importing huge volumes. So these have to have uh, these certificates for protection of the public who are going to use these uh, used items. Then we have transit documents. Uh, sometimes uh, goods that are moving through transit, then you need to have those documents as uh, one of the re regulatory documents that are required for cargo clearance. And maybe lastly, uh, 
we have the certificates of conformity, uh, what we normally call the PVOC, especially from our colleagues in, in UNDS. Many a times, um, some of the cargo doesn't come with uh, these documents, and it is causing a lot of delays in our system. It is one of the issues that is causing uh, uh, the clearance times to, to for cargo to uh, in, increase. Lastly, we have the financial documents. Now, these are some of the documents where we have perennial issues with our taxpayers, um, mainly because these are the documents that will actually confirm the value of the goods, especially when it comes to the uh, document check and valuation of the goods that were clearing through customs. So depending on the terms that have been agreed by the buyer and seller, we expect to see these documents uh, pr presented to enable us to validate the value as declared to customs. Uh, some of these documents are like uh, the telegraphic transfer, which we normally uh, easily call uh, as the TT. We have letters of credit, bank drafts or bill of exchange, and then the credit agreement. These documents actually are supposed to also manage the risk on, part on the part of the, of the seller because sometimes when uh, money is not paid upfront, how does then the seller safeguard his interests if we don't have such instruments? So depending on the level of risk, the, the parties can choose which instrument will best address the risk when it comes to payment for the goods. I'll briefly go through this because uh, many times when we query uh, our importers to provide this information, there is a bit of misunderstanding. So I need to just briefly go through these uh, financial documents for us to be able to understand why we ask for these documents. For example, when we look at the telegraphic transfer, in many cases, if, we, if your commercial invoice clearly indicates that you are paying maybe 60% upfront, or if you're paying straight up for the goods that you have imported, then our expectation is that we are going to see a telegraphic transfer to the supplier indicating how much you paid or depending on the terms that you've agreed. So we ask for this information, but when we ask, we expect that this TT or telegraphic transfer will actually relate to the goods and the documents that we have. We expect that it will be indicate the invoice, it will indicate the the, the consignment that actually is being declared. Uh, the other document is the letter of credit. As you know, um, cash is not usually readily available and uh, credit transactions are very common in international trade. But how do you safeguard the, 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 the supplier against non-payment? So what the banking institutions have come up uh, with is an instrument to try and facilitate this international trade. So we have uh, documents, instruments such as the letter of credit. Now this letter of credit is issued by uh, the buyer's bank to the seller's uh, bank, guaranteeing that they will pay a certain amount after a certain number of days that have been agreed as the credit period. Now, most times this is a, a very authentic and uh, reliable uh, document uh, for indicating the, the value of good because it involves more than one party. It involves actually four parties. It involves the seller, the buyer, the buyer's bank, and the seller's bank. So it is a more reliable source of information when it comes to uh, the actual value of the goods especially if the credit terms are, are, are long, where normally we normally see invoices, someone indicating we have uh, 90 days credit, 120 days credit. So how do, does the seller secure their interest for all those days? That's why we have such instruments. And in cases where we see invoices indicating those long credit periods, we will normally ask for such uh, documents Otherwise, uh, we do not expect that the seller can just give you goods 
uh, for 120 days without any security. Then the other document is the financial uh, document is the bank guarantee. This one is uh, more like a, a letter of credit, but in a, in, in a sense that it is just issued by the seller's, the buyer's bank to the seller, but uh, it is a guarantee that the bank will pay uh, when the amount is due to the, to the seller. So it is as good as cash, only that it is not normally seen in international trade because it, co it is costly to the, to the buyer because they have to have that amount of money in the bank. And in most cases, it is, it is less used unless the seller insists on using uh, this kind of instrument. Uh, the other document w is uh, usually, we, in rare cases, uh, bank overdrafts uh, are used. Uh, but what is, is, is an another financial document that is normally common is, uh, is the bank draft or bill of exchange. This is more like a check, but instead of being issued by the buyer, it is issued by the bank to the, to the seller. So it guarantees the seller the amount of money that the buyer owes and that it will be paid on a specific date as indicated on the, on the document. So I, this, these are the financial documents that we, we have. And then in many cases, uh, we see, we're seeing credit agreements being agreed between uh, the buyer and seller. But this is a, a more risky document because uh, it is just between the buyer and seller as an agreement which can be enforced in the courts of law but easily violated. It is mainly used by the parties that are related. And uh, so when we, s in situations where we see credit agreements being used as the financial documents, then we'll be interested in finding out how are these parties related? How is it that they can trust themselves to just transact based on a credit agreement without having other third parties to guarantee uh, the payment. So most times we are, we are trying to inquire into uh, transactions where there are credit agreements to, to make sure that actually what is being declared is, uh, is the correct thing to facilitate the trade. Uh, so in summary, it is important that uh, the WT8 is captured well and the right information is captured on this declaration. These documents are important for us to be able to quickly vet these declarations and release for faster clearance. Now, the, impo the, the important documents that we must attach are, uh, are documents such as the bill of lading, the parking list. These are critical to the declarants, especially because they will help them to uh, make the worksheets and uh, tax computations where they are capturing these declarations. The commercial invoice, clearly showing the terms that have been agreed between the buyer and seller. And uh, because as you know, or you may not know, our declaration, our value is based on the CIF. So the terms on the invoice will guide the declarant on how they capture. Uh, if any information is missing, then they will be able to ask the the importer to provide the additional documents. Uh, freight invoices in case the terms that have been agreed uh, may, um, do not include the freight or insurance, it is important that the freight invoice is attached so that we, do, we avoid these back and forth uh, inquiries between customs to provide the, the document. For example, if it is uh, an invoice based on F4B, it is important that the client attaches the freight invoice without having to be prompted by customs provided, because anyway, how do, do the goods move from the port of origin to the port of destination without uh, paying for the freight? Uh, most importantly, we should have worksheets attached, worksheets for tax computations, uh, so that it clearly shows the person vetting the declaration how the declaration was captured and how the taxes declared have been arrived at. This eases the work of the officer and helps in faster clearance. What I usually recommend for best practices is that what we see is that 
the declarants are bundling items into, let's say if the invoice has 10 items, you see someone uh, declaring three items and bundling the different items into, into one or two. And now that, uh, what I've observed, it complicates and you are prone to making errors which will be uh, prone to offenses. What I usually recommend is that if you have an invoice which has 20 items, the ASCUDA system allows you even to capture up to 200 or even more items. Why then do you have to bundle up items and then when you're asked, it is difficult for you to explain and especially so if you don't have a detailed worksheet. So it is best and adv advisable that every item on your invoice should be captured separately. That will ease the vetting process. That will ease any inquiries that is being made into the declaration that has been made. Now, upon completion of vetting, the DPC, in the DPC, the WTA shall be released in the system, and that will automatically trigger the auto-conversion process uh, once validation happens, and then, then the goods will go into the warehousing. So it is important that the right information is captured at the WTA level so that we do not have the delays associated with having to amend entries which were wrongly captured. Over to you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ifrain. Thank you so much. You've done a very wonderful job. I believe it is now clear uh, to everyone the kind of documents that, that we need on the declaration and the importance of those documents. Uh, viewers, thank you so much once more for tuning in. This is still Customs 101, and we are looking at the enhanced clearance of cargo from the port. My name is Nicholas Aruho, and I'm your moderator today. In case you have any question, uh, feel free to go into the Q&A and type in your question. We shall answer all your questions. So just check out for Q&A and type your question. The panelists will give you answers. Uh, now, uh, we are still moving ahead. I want to turn to you, Thomas. You sit at Mombasa and you do a lot of work there. So I would like us to take us through uh, what you do at <coughs> Mombasa, uh, the role you play at the port, uh, the T1 validation process uh, under SPT, and of course to inform the importers and clearing agents what they need to do to ensure faster clearance of cargo from the port such that cargo doesn't delay at the port. Uh, kindly take us through your process at the port in relation to the WT8 and the T1. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, and thank you, my co-presenters. Um, as they have clearly explained, after a release of a WT8 in DPC, the month is passed on to the teams in customs external operations, that is Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, we also have some cargo that is transferred from within among us ourselves as partner states to the bonded warehouses. So it does not only uh, come to the port of Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, but we also have cargo that comes from within the region, which also goes into the bonded warehouses. So once a WT8 is released, um, all clearing agents have access rights to the system to generate their own T1. And uh, once you generate this T1, it means the process of cargo evacuation has started. But though there are other processes that uh, take place at the first point of entry, and um, this T1, you need a transporter to move the cargo from uh, Mombasa, from Dar es Salaam, from Nairobi to the bonded warehouse. You will submit this T1 to your transporter to plan for transporting of the cargo, but even before you generate, you need to seek for truck details and other additional information for you to generate this T1. And when you're generating this T1 for the case of maritime cargo, the cargo that is at Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, ensure that uh, you indicate the shipper's seal that is on the bill of lading, that is if it was not changed. So the transporter or the third party agent who is on the other end will do what we call booking in the, in the Kenya Post Authority system and they will obtain what we call a position slip. Later on down we shall see how this position slip looks like. 
And uh, once you obtain that position slip with your T1, you'll be able to lodge a request on the help tool to request for validation of departure of this T1. Validation of departure is very important because that's what migrates data to our other revenue authorities for them to enable, to be able to generate C2s. But also after validation of departure, we shall resolve your ticket and tell you that the T1 has been departed. Then uh, once this truck is in the port, they also have to proceed for rects, whereby they have to arm the consignment with a seal. All containers from the port of Mombasa, from uh, Naivasha ICD, from uh, Nairobi ICD, comes under regional electronic cargo tracking. It still has to be armed by Kenya Revenue Authority. Then at that point, you're ready to proceed to the gate for a C2, and uh, at that point, you're getting out of the port. The Kenya Revenue Authority staff will generate a C2. Like I told you, if this T1 is not departed, you will not be able to get the C2. Those are the issues we normally get, which uh, affects uh, delays in uh, delay in cargo evacuation. Someone goes to the gate, they have not departed the T1, and you find they are failing to get a C2 and clogging the queue at the gate. So always ensure that this T1 is departed for you to proceed to the gate to get the C2. And once the C2 is generated, the journey of the cargo commences from the port or from the first point of entry or from Dar es Salaam to the bonded warehouse, as my colleagues have been talking about. Um, basically, that process has not changed. It is the same. It's just for purposes of emphasis. But now, what do you need to know uh, in order for you to avoid delays in cargo evacuation process? Point number one, our customs agents, stroke third party agents, uh, suppose to use the correct options on the help tool when making their requests. If the request is for Mombasa, lodge it under Kemba, you'll find the options of Kemba. If it's for Nairobi, you'll see the options for Nairobi. If it's for Naivasha, Dar es Salaam, and Nakuru. Because now, if you lodge it under a wrong classification on the help tool, it will go to a different person who does not even handle your task. So always ensure that you lodge these issues under the correct classification on the help tool. Then uh, point number two, always ensure that you have enough RCTG bond because like Edman told us, this cargo is bonded along the transit route using the regional customs transit guarantee. So when you request for validation, the system will check to see if you have enough bond. If it's not enough, it means the T1 validation will not go through. So always check using the single window link. It is uh, provided there. I think all agents have access to this single window link whereby you log in using your e-tax uh, credentials on the single window portal and you're able to know your balance even before you check for request for validation of departure of this T1. Um, the other issue is forwarders should make sure that they complete the shipping line processes and the other port processes. Issues of customs hold in the KPS system for containerized cargo should always be escalated to our emails. There is an email for Mombasa team. This is one of the major challenges we have. You find the entries list in DPC that is supposed to exchange with our Kenya Post Authority system, but it fails due to some system errors or other errors that are committed at the declaration. But if you do some checks like we are going to see below and you find everything is okay, uh, send your query on the emails, the email for KPA and uh, URA at Mombasa. We shall be able to facilitate you on time. Um, issues of C2 generation or no matching records, this one should also be uh, escalated to us through the help tool. You find you've reached the gate, everything is okay, you've completed your process, but um, still you're failing to generate C2. Please raise that issue on help tool and we shall be able to facilitate you in time. Uh, clearing agents should make accurate declarations when assessing entries, and if there are any amendment requests, use the right selection of issue on help tool. Yes, uh, we are human beings, we are prone to making of errors. Uh, in case you make an error, please raise the issue on help tool. The issue that is supposed to be amended for Mombasa, don't lodge it under DPC. 
because the DPC officer will still eventually refer you back to the team in Mombasa. If the issue is for Naivasha, look for options of Naivasha and lose the issue to the Naivasha team to handle. So let's raise these issues on the right options on the help tool for us to be able to get instant help to avoid delays. All we are looking at is faster clearance of cargo from uh, external operations from Dar es Salaam, from Mombasa, from Nairobi, from all over. Uh, customs all for containerized cargo, all containers by default when they are discharged at the port of Mombasa, the Kenya Post Authority system tags them for a customs hold, which is removed when a release is uh, done by our DPC counterparts, our document processing center. But in scenarios where it fails, and normally these are the causes that cause our cus the customs hold. And uh, before you send the email that I gave earlier, first do a self-check to see if these conditions are fulfilled. First of all, for the customs hold to be uh, off the Kenya Post Authority system, the entry must be released. If the entry is in system root green, you're supposed to maybe untag with NDA or UNBS. It's green, but it's not print released. Ensure that the print release is done. And the good thing here, all our agents have access to the system to do this for themselves. Always ensure that the entry has a print release order. Then containerized cargo, always check box 19. This is so critical in as far as a maritime cargo that is containerized is concerned. If you don't check box 19, much as the entry is released above, the entry will still tag for a custom hold. So ensure that uh, you've checked the box 19 and you've declared all the containers correctly for maritime cargo. When the third party agent is not captured in box 51, still this one causes custom hold. Even if the other two conditions above are fulfilled and this one is not declared, still you'll have a custom hold. Box 51, ensure you always put the pin for the person who is responsible for cargo evacuation in the port. We call them third party agents, but the other side they call them forwarders. Um, then also the location of goods on box 30 of your side. Always ensure that it is Kemba. Some bills come with other locations, but you can always reach to us to change that one to Kemba. It does not take any cost, we can change it, but uh, when it's not Kemba, like I said, even if the other three conditions above are fulfilled, still you have issues. Then the last scenario is when there is a data exchange failure. You find everything is fulfilled, all conditions are okay, but still you have a custom sold. Right to us to the emails I suggested earlier for us to be able to facilitate. Um, the other thing that you need to know, there is cargo that is selected for mandatory weighing, especially for the port of Mombasa which accounts for almost 80% of uh, warehousing cargo that comes to Uganda. Uh, due to the risks and analysis that has been done, the cargo listed below is selected for mandatory weighing before you evacuate the port. Meaning when you book to enter the port, uh, load the container. First, of course, go to the weigh bridge, weigh the empty container. Then after that, after loading the container, proceed also to the weigh bridge to weigh this cargo. And uh, we have officers at the weigh bridge who work 24-7. And uh, in this scenario, you don't have to use the help tool to request for validation of departure of these T1s because the officer who will participate in the weighing of this cargo will be available at the weigh bridge to validate this T1 for you to proceed to the ceiling and to the uh, get to get the C2 and uh, that cargo includes uh, containerized steel products. Uh, we have uh, containerized used bags, used shoes, used clothes, all those whose payment of tax is valued in, uh, in weight. So those ones you have to weigh before validation and the validation like I said will be done at the weigh bridge. Uh, textile fabrics materials, Provided they are containers and you're leaving the port, they will be weighed from the port. So even if you put your request on help tool, someone will still refer you back to the web So to avoid delays, let's adhere to this. We have uh, containers, new shoes, new bags, uh, new suitcases, uh, headgears uh, of chapter 65. 
hardware items of chapter 82 and uh, also we have what we call targeting sometimes we can see something in the system that we think should uh, proceed to weighing we have a way of controlling to forward you to the weigh bridge to do the weighing uh, so any other item that we think should weigh we also refer to the weigh bridge and uh, after the weighing the validation will be done at that point so there is no need of using of help tool to request for validation of departure of such t1s um, for those who have not seen the position slip I talked about when you're requesting for validation of departure on the help tool for containerized cargo, ensure you attach this position slip. First of all, it has the details of the container. It has the truck number. It also tells us where the container is and the date. So this one is a control which enables us to be sure that the container we are validating is still within the port. Um, in conclusion, what we encourage agents or forwarders to do, these processes, the port processes, the shipping lane process, and the ERA process that is released in DPC can take place at the same time. You find you have loaded your entry, it is under processing in DPC, but at the same time you are doing the securing of the delivery order from the shipping lane. and. Uh, not until you secure the delivery order and the release from uh, DPC, that's when you can start the port process. Then after the port process, we will validate your T1, and after validation of T1, you'll proceed to the gate to get a C2 for the cargo to commence its journey. So those processes work hand in hand, you can start all at once, but uh, each one leads to the other. That is it from me, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thomas, for taking us through the port process at Mombasa, uh, which I believe is the same for Dar es Salaam. Uh, thank you so much, viewers, for tuning in. Uh, ask your questions, go to Q&A and type in your questions, and we shall answer all of them live. Uh, we are still talking about the enhanced clearance process for goods from the port uh, with a special emphasis on WT8. And I have an official from DPC, uh, uh, an official from warehousing, and an official from the port. Uh, now, I will first stay with you, Thomas. There is a question here from Kiara Anthony. Uh, and he would like to know, in case of any amendments on WT8, which ones can be done at DPC and which ones at KEMBA SCT level? At what point do I contact DPC or SCT for alterations on WT8? Uh, you can say something about that. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. For, and thank you, Anthony, for the question. Uh, from the port of Mombasa, from SCT, the amendments that we handle are the amendments that do not have any value implication because the valuation experts are in our DPC. If you have anything to amend that has a value implication like supplementary units, like HS code, uh, like CIF value, documents, those ones will, ref will request you to lodge the request under DPC. But uh, under external operations, Mombasa, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, the boxes that we amend, basically they are boxes that do not have a value implication like box 30, box 51, box 19. The boxes generally that do not have a value implication mm. that does not take a lot of time for us to research about the values, the HS codes and the classification. Mm. I hope I've answered. Anthony. Yeah. Yes, you have. You have. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, Juma, I think this one, Ifraim, I will direct it to you. Uh, Juma is asking who provides the facultantary certificate in the case of used shoes and clothes. Thank you very much, Juma, for this question. Uh, now, these used clothes are exported from various countries, USA, um, China, the EU. So, at when, when you order for these goods, you ask your supplier to make sure they are issued with that sanitary certificate from origin. Because when you come here to Uganda, you will not be able to, to get that certificate. So it is issued at the origin. So you always ask 
a supplier that when, uh, as one of the documents they send you should be the phytosanitary certificate, which is, will be issued by di different agencies in different countries. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Uh, there is this one here. Uh, Juma again is still asking, uh, what happens if the worksheet doesn't have updated information? I don't know whether you understand that. Uh, I, I, I don't really know what it means when the worksheet doesn't have updated information, but what I can say about the worksheet is we expect that the worksheet is a representation of what someone is declaring, and it is generated from the documents that the, the declarant has. So we expect that all the items declared are clearly indicated on the worksheet, which shows the tax computation. So updated information, all the information should be available before you actually make the worksheet and eventually the declaration. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sumaya from Atlas Cargo is asking for the slides. We shall share uh, and, and the whole presentation will actually be uploaded on YouTube. So feel free to, to visit our YouTube channel. Just type in URA TV and you will see all the presentations uh, and the whole, the whole show. Uh, Anthony, you, you're tuning in. Thank you so much. Uh, now, let me ask, okay, uh, I have more questions here uh, in the chat, um, uh, but as I check them, let me ask Edmund, uh, I know you talked briefly about it, but I kindly repeat for the viewers the implication of a wrong uh, declaration at WT8 level. Kind of repeat how it affects you at warehousing level uh, when a wrong declaration is made at, at WT8. Okay, thank you, moderator Nicholas, and thank you, my fellow panelists, for a wonderful presentation. And equally, thank you, the viewers and listeners. We've seen that a WT8 is a primary declaration, and once you have it wrong, all subsequent processes get affected. Like the way we normally say, once you begin it in a wrong way, you end it in a wrong way. We normally say that if you wake up early and uh, knock your head on the door, the entire day is going to be associated with the problems. So, equally in the same way, once you have a wrong WT8, right away from the port, they will begin flagging you off as they weigh you. You reach at the borders, they will scan you and they will flag you. You reach at the inland checkpoints, they will flag you. You reach at the bonded warehouses, you will be fragged, intelligence will frag you, and by the time you enter the bonded warehouses, you will actually be like a real suspect who is even due for arrest. <laughs> so to avoid all that, you must perfect. So if you enter wrong data right off from the first port of entry, it means, like I said, it will be garbage in, garbage out. Upon auto-conversion, it means that insufficient data which you captured right off from the port of entry is the same data we are going to have in our stock, which means we are going to have pseudo stock at the end of it all. We shall have full stock. Our stock records will be showing that you have eight items, yet in actual sense, you had 15 items. Now, the moment you miss it right off from the beginning, now all associated delays and costs will come in. First of all, you will be penalized upon verification. It means they will find and declared and under declared items. You'll go through the offense process. You know how hectic it is. Upon paying the relevant penalties, again, the entry must go through an amendment. It's what my colleague Murindo talked about, amending an entry. Just imagine you have declared eight items, and during verification, we find 60 items. That is like fresh declaration. Someone must be fresh. He must say, ah, no, I'm already tired to amend this entry. Let me do it with a fresh mind the following day. All those are delays which are associated. And you know, once you delay, then automatically you lose out. When it comes to money, you are losing out because time is money. So once you miss it out, it means we shall have full stock. And the process of rectifying the appropriate stock is cumbersome, is costly, and time consuming. So that's why our core, our humble core, our humble cry is that let's have it right off from the beginning. 
so that we shall have it right away until the end and save the cost, save the inconveniences, save all kinds of obstacles along the clearance if we have a right declaration. So, panelist, that is all I can explain in as far as having an imperfect declaration of a WTA writer from the beginning. Thank you so much, Edman. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Moderator, maybe to add on what uh, uh, Edmond has said, Yes. we need uh, our clients, our stakeholders, to, to notice that there's been uh, some change. With the introduction of BRIMS, which my colleague talked about, we no longer have the CW7s. Now, the CW7s would allow uh, the, the agents to capture the excess items on, uh, on a new entry. Mm -hmm. But now with introduction of BRIMS, the, we no longer have the CW7s, uh, goods being deposited in the customs warehouse. The goods have to be managed within BRIMS. The, you, ha you have to have the stock in BRIMS. And with that change, it is now impacting on the processes that we have. If the agents are not perfect with the WT8, that is when we'll have a lot of amendment uh, issues and wasting a lot of time. So that is what he was emphasizing. So the practices that we had when we had the CW7s need to change now because that laxity of having uh, uh, an imperfect WT8, we, we now do not have that luxury because it has to be perfect. Otherwise, it is going to cause a lot of delays and it's going to be very costly to, to our business. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for that addition. And I will stay with you, Ephraim. Uh, Peter Muri here is asking about TSEs. I know this is not under your decade right now, but I, I, I know you know something about it. Uh, you can probably advise him on how best to submit his TSC request because he was asking why creation of TSCs take long. Thank you very much, Peter, for that question. Uh, the TSC is, is basically a tariff specification code, and this is a, a, a code that is used to manage uh, the valuation module. Uh, that is the module for managing valuation of imported goods that are tagged to TSCs. Now, this is a requirement for a product which is tagged to have a, a tariff specification code. Now, what happens is, we have these documents and this information, and we wait till the very end when we are capturing a declaration to ask for the, for the TSCs. Now, the TSC request should be, first of all, directed to the valuation team that is at the headquarters, valuation headquarters, and not uh, DPC. It should be directed to the valuation team. But it is advisable that you ask for this these TSCs way before you make a declaration, way even before the cargo arrives at Mombasa, because you have the information, you have the documents. And this is what we've been talking about. If you have the documents, make your worksheets early, and when you realize that this particular item requires the TSC, make your request early, because it, to, to create the TSC, it's a process. It's about validating the invoice and the value of the item. So it is not a matter of data entry, but it's about validating the information before a TSC is eventually created. So my advice is, before when you receive the information, even before the goods arrive in Mombasa, you make your request to our team in valuation. They should be able to uh, create the TSC in time. But if you wait till the very end, because of the processes that are involved in the creation of the TSCs, it will seem like uh, it is a delay to you, but that is what is required to actually create the TSC. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Uh, uh, Thomas, I will direct this to you. Anthony Kasegere is asking uh, if he has cargo in Nairobi, uh, does he have to capture WT8? Ekemba WT8 or Nairobi WT8? So <laughs> I think he, he doesn't understand. It. So, Throw some light on, on those regimes. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for the question, and thank you, moderator. Uh, under single customs territory, we have two types of cargo. We have maritime cargo, that is cargo from outside the region, over the high seas into the region. Then we have what we call intra-region cargo, which we also call transfers. Cargo that is traded amongst ourselves as partner states. 
If cargo is from Nairobi to a bonded warehouse, yes, you can capture a WT8. But the difference here, in box 29 of your declaration, you capture SCTKE, that is Single Customs Territory, Kenya. Whereas for Maritime, box 29, you capture Kemba. Then also box 30, when cargo is from Nairobi, you capture KenB, not, not Kemba. If cargo is from um, Tanzania, and it is transferred to Uganda, box 29, you capture SCT, TZ, SCT, or SCT, TZ. Whereas if it's maritime, in box 29, you capture TZ. So yes, you can capture WT8. Office up in box 1 will be Kemba, but the difference is on box 29 and box 30. So you can capture a WT8 for cargo from a factory in Nairobi, a factory in Nakuru. The only difference is box 29 and box 30. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, Ephraim, uh, you can throw some light on this question. Roni Kaija uh, is asking uh, why sometimes DPC doesn't honor the values attached to, to TSCs. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Roni. Thank you very much, Roni, for this question. Um, I well, I, I, I may need to understand when he says uh, we, we don't honor the value as attached to the TSCs. Well, my understanding of the TSCs is that uh, this is the evaluation uh, risk, uh, risk management tool. And uh, when the team in valuation is setting these values, they set a, a certain range, which uh, ideally is uh, the value of, of the product. However, when we are doing valuation, we go with the first principles. We have to look at the documents first. We won't go straight into the TSCs. We will look at the documents because we have to apply the valuation me method sequentially from method one, method two, as, as indicated in the, in the fourth schedule. So it is not um, enough for one to declare and the value as in because it is just a range. It is not a specific value. And the reason why it is a range, because it, is, it allows for different prices at different times. So at this particular time, we will need to know how you arrived at that value. And that's why we have to go through the documentation to ascertain the prevailing price. Because the TSC could have been set maybe three years ago. The price three years ago and now is different. But because it is a range, it allows for the price to be within that. So the documents, the transaction documents, will actually indicate the price paid or payable at, at the particular time the declaration is made. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that clarification. Uh, we are trying to wrap up. We are wrapping up. Uh, but if you still have any question, viewers, uh, you can go to the chat or to Q&A and type it, uh, and we shall answer it in the next. We still have a few minutes but we are wrapping up. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, I will still come back to you, Ephraim. Uh, I would like you to clarify to, to the viewers. Uh, we are talking about attaching documents. We are emphasizing attaching documents to, to the WT8. Uh, and some of the viewers may look at it as a new, uh, as a new policy or a new law. Kindly tell us, is, is this a new law? Has customs come up with a new law? that talks about attaching documents, kind of clarify on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, attaching documents is, is, is not a new law in any way. When you look at uh, trade happening internationally, it happens uh, and it, it is the documents that indicate that actually transaction has happened. We are only seeking these documents to actually validate what has been agreed between the buyer and the seller and any necessary regulatory documents that are required for clearance of that particular category of cargo. Now, what is happening is just that initially, uh, less emphasis was put on the WT8 uh, because first of all, we wanted to facilitate, we, there was a bit of laxity, trying to facilitate so that our colleagues in Uganda do not incur uh, excess costs at the Port of Mombasa, so we were clearing WTH without really scrutinizing these documents. Uh, but now, with the uh, advent of auto conversion and BIMS particularly, uh, we realize that actually if we do that, we are even creating more 
uh, challenges for our uh, trading community and even increasing the, the costs of doing business and delaying the facilitation process. So it is now imperative that we perfect the primary document, which is the WTA, so that there's consistency right from the port. We do not want to see the current scenario that is prevailing, whereby when you have the declaration of the WTA and you compare it with the IM4 declaration that X warehouses the goods, and you have two completely different uh, documents. Our appeal to our counterparts, to our, our partners, the declarants, and even the importer, is that let's make our work easier. Let us capture the declarations as per the information on the documents. And when DPC asks for this information, please ably provide it in good time so that the clearance can ha happen faster. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. We are coming to the end of, of, of this. Uh, now I'm going to allow um, uh, panelists to, to give their parting shot, uh, but I will begin with Edmund, kindly give you uh, concluding remarks, and if there is anything else that you would want our viewers to know before we leave here. Thank you, Nicholas. And thank you once again, our viewers and listeners. Some bit of clarification again to amplify what uh, my colleague Murindo has just talked about. Initially or traditionally, we all know that we used to have a T1. We would reach the bonded warehouses, validate that T1, and generate an inward manifest. And the inward manifest was so flexible that someone who had not complied from the WT8 to IM8 would still comply at that level. What do I mean? That's when we had the cases of pre-verification. Someone approaches you, he tells you, I'm not sure of what I bought, <laughs> much as it sounds funny because for you can't say you went to China, <laughs> bought, and now at warehousing you don't know what you bought. Or oh, I don't know things that were loaded as if they add you items that you did not buy. But still we had that tax day, would accommodate, we say please you are out, let's pre-verify so that you can make a proper declaration. Upon pre-verification, maybe if you had declared two items, we actually find 16 items where, where you had already confessed that you don't know additional items. And the manifest was so flexible in a way that so long as you maintain the packages and weights of, of the manifest, you would go ahead and declare all the 60 items you would have found at verification as opposed to maybe two items. That was the beauty by then. So in between the process, you had a gap to comply by making a proper declaration, so you would find that the DPC now is able to receive a proper declaration. But now gone are the days. The fact that we introduced auto-conversion and games, you no longer have that middle compliance aspect. Actually, pre-verification has even died because you would pre-verify so that you are given an opportunity to make a right declaration. But now if you say, let me pre-verify, the declaration is already existing. Which one are you going to make a right one? It's already existing. So, the fact that you do not have a pre-verification, the fact that in the middle of the process you don't have any gap for you to make a right declaration, means that each transaction fetches from another transaction. Each transaction fetches from another transaction. A T1 will fetch from a WT8. An IM7 auto conversion will automatically fetch from a T1. An IM4 equally fetches from an IM7. So you no longer have an opportunity, you as a declarant or as a client, to make a right declaration. So for you to do it now, it means you must do it right away from the beginning, right away from the first point of declaration, either a WT8 or an IM8, so that you avoid, since you no longer have a chance of complying or rectifying in between, so that you have the right data or through the processes. So all in all, moderator and dear listeners and viewers, this is a call upon you that you do it right from the beginning. You always have it right until the end. We are available, running never ceases. Please don't fear. Approach us either virtually or physically. Phone calls we are available and we shall be able to guide each other as we proceed and continue to develop our Uganda together. I thank you.
Thank you so much, Edmund. Edmund Rutebenberwa, Acting Manager, Warehousing. Uh, now I will get the parting shot from Thomas and then Murindwa. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, actually, my parting shot is in regarding to what Edmund is saying with the introduction of booms and auto conversion. Uh, there was a call for all our declarants to have a declaration rate from the first point of entry. And in that way, our systems team enhance the system on the area of Manfest, whereby if you have a bill of lading which has two packages and uh, your parking list is showing you maybe 20 items, you can increase your packages by splitting the bill. Um, what you need to do is uh, to raise the ticket to us on help tool, whereby we shall authorize you to split, but uh, more to that, according to Regulation 216 of the East African Community Customs Management Regulations, splitting of a bill is regarded as a manifest amendment. We shall issue an MPF, a payment of $10. Once you pay, we shall allow you to split. All agents have access to splitting of manifest stroke bill.